systematic and expository study of the Bible at the Deeper Life Bible Church offers you an enriching steady spiritual growth, thus opening your eyes to God's own way of righteousness. In this case, you will have the opportunity to listen to one such enriching Bible study. So prepare your heart to be blessed. Let us pray. A great God in heaven and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bless your name for bringing us together today so that we can study your word. Oh Lord, it's always a beautiful thing when children can gather around the table with the parents and eat delicious meal from the table. Lord, we ask that as we gather together, to each this meal, the food, the bread of life, that you will strengthen every one of us with this nourishing food spiritually in Jesus' name. Amen. The word of God is the bread of life. And when we take that word of God, meditate on that word of God, digest that word of God, apply that word of God, it strengthens us from within. The word of God is like the water of life refreshing us and giving us all that we need to have so that we can grow in our relationship with the Lord. The Word of God is like fire that burns every chaff, every dross, every carelessness from our lives. Oh Lord, we know that this Word is compared to the hammer that is able to break all rocks in pieces and the hardness of heart. You can completely break and destroy. Father, we pray that today, as we come together, touching the word, believing the word, studying the word, we pray, O oh Lord, will never be the same again in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, make us the people that we are to be. Cleanse us, put us on fire, take all lukewarmness away from us, feed us with this bread of life, so that we can be nourished in the word of righteousness, and so that we can be the people we ought to be prepared unto every good work. Lord, make us zealous in the things of the Lord, so that all your purpose and plan for our lives and for the life of the church 
through us you will fulfill in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank the Lord for bringing us to the Bible study today. And I'm so happy you are here. And I welcome every one of us, every one of you, in Jesus' name. You know, it's so wonderful to come together like this and end the day with the Lord. Sit around the table and listen to our Savior, our Master, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, from his word and through his word, talking to us and directing us as to the way we ought to spend our lives and the way we ought to live our lives here on earth. If you look at the study today, you will see that I'm still dealing with the special series in our study. I'm doing this on purpose. I told you last Monday that the weekend before this last weekend, we had a meeting, special meeting, with the coordinators of the English district churches, coordinators of the language churches as well, our women coordinators and selected leaders among uh, the children workers and uh, some of the people that are dealing with the students work as well. I got the coordinators together so that we could discuss together on the work of the church and we actually dealt with a number of issues. We dealt with how the church will grow from the little moderate size it is now to growing beyond a thousand. We dealt with various areas and various programs and various possibilities that your district church here can get through so that you can grow. It was a time of planning and revealing workable, practical, sound strategies. Not only that, we spoke about the choir, an important concern in the district church and how the members of the choir ought to be selected, how many people still ought to join them at present and how the district coordinator ought to supervise even in the choir, how everything ought to be done so that we can raise a definite, a sound choir that will be able to lead the church in worship, in edification and inspiration. Then we talked about something very essential, very important about the building of the district church. How we can raise up a beautiful temple for the glory of God and for worship. A place that is solid enough, beautiful enough, that will be able to reflect what we understand about the glory of God. That will be able to worship God in the beauty of holiness. Then we talked about the training, the equipping and the mobilizing of workers in the district church so that the work will be done. And uh, we dealt with a lot of other things. And I told the coordinators, and your coordinator in particular, that the coordinator in the district is like the evangelist, the teacher, the pastor of the district church so that he'll be able to plan programs and he'll be able to get a lot of things done that the church in the district will grow. And I believe as you members of the church, you cooperate with your coordinator and you move along with your coordinator and you get all the things that has to be done, you get everything done as he will lead, as he is being led by the, by the pastor and also by the Spirit of God. I believe the church in the district will go, grow and it will grow speedily in Jesus' name. Now, he'll be planning programs. He'll be making a lot of announcements to you. He'll be telling you things that have to be done. And listen to me. I want you to cooperate with the coordinator as if I, myself, the pastor, came to you and I gave you that same challenge. And I gave you that same announcement. And I gave you that same responsibility. Just like you will arise immediately, instantly. And you will cooperate and you will obey and you will do that thing joyfully if i myself came to tell you directly in your district church here that's the way i want you to respond as our coordinator will be talking to us on what we're going to do we also emphasized the various areas of the work in the district that has been neglected or not taken care of in a proper way we talked about the ministry of the women's coordinator in this district. And that it is not just 
an empty title. That the women's coordinator in this district is actually to have a very clear and good biblical relationship with all the women in the district so that she can plan programs and she can bring other people into the kingdom of God, other women in the district. And we want to, we want to help them, assist them. And we want to, as a whole church, recognize the place and the position and the ministry and the work of a women coordinator in this district. Not only that, we talk about the ministry to the children. We noted with concern, with grief, with sorrow, with shame, that we have dealt with the children's church as if the children's church was insignificant, as if it was unnecessary, as if it was a waste, as if it is not important at all and that the district should not have anything to do with it, with shame, with sorrow, with anguish in our heart. We noted that the place where we put our children many times has no good ventilation. Many times the workers we give to the children's church, they are not qualified, competent workers. We noted with sorrow and shame that we have treated our children with less understanding than the people of the world will deal with the children. You see, even the people of the world and in the educational system, they will spend so much on the children so that because they know that the children of today are the adults and the leaders of tomorrow. But we decided in that meeting, like the other weekend, that we'll take care of the children's work. We'll give them qualified workers. And as we are thinking about building a beautiful temple to the glory of God, we're going to also build something for the children where we'll be able to have, uh, in fact, we talk about the children having their own choir among themselves. And they've been taught rudiments of music. And they've been able to sing well to the glory of God. We even talked about the possibility of those children having flutes, having musical instruments, so that they'll be praising the Lord. And what we have in mind for the district church is something that will measure up to the glory, the beauty of worship in the New Testament. And so our coordinator, the uh, coordinator that's in charge of everything, will be talking to you. We'll be planning with you. We'll be developing strategies with you. Please accept him. Accept all the plans. Cooperate with the plan. And uh, don't say this is too much, that is too much. Do it as if I were there myself. Let's cooperate together. The Lord will bless you. And the Lord will accomplish the work through you in Jesus' name. Amen. If you are happy, let me have a greater amen. amen. God bless you. We'll do the work together. And the study we're going to have today is a kind of follow-up on what we have already discussed in that, um, in that special meeting so that we can bring all our members, all our workers in the know of everything we discuss with the coordinators so that we ourselves will cooperate and will be working in the same direction. You see, the coordinator alone cannot do it. He can develop strategies and methods and activities and evangelistic outreaches, crusades and a lot of things, but we need you. He needs you. The whole church needs you. I'll be praying along with you, and I'm sure that you are going to succeed in Jesus' name. Yeah. This church will grow. Yeah. This church will be established. Yeah. The gates of hell will not prevail against this church where you are now. Yeah. God will help you. Go ahead. Be more committed in the work of God. Those who are not workers before, the call is coming to you now. Get involved and God will bless you for it. Amen. Today, we're looking at the mission of Christ's church. The mission of Christ's church. Let's turn our Bibles together to Matthew chapter 28 from verse 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. Amen. Here we have what Christ said to the disciples before he left. 
I want you to notice that Christ in his earthly ministry carried out a divinely appointed mission. He revealed the love of God and the grace of God to man. He gave up everything, everything. He gave up his position. He gave up his right. He gave up his glory and life so that he can reveal and reconcile man unto God. With that mission accomplished, then he left the world and he went to the Father in heaven. But just before he left, he told the church, the group of disciples that gathered around him, that they were to carry on and continue the same mission he had started. And the mission is in two parts. Number one, to reveal God to man through Christ. Number two, to reconcile man to God through Christ. On the one hand, reveal God to man. On the other hand, reconcile man unto God. And all tied in through the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what is referred to as the Great Commission. In the meeting I referred to that we had the other weekend, we said every one of us, as leaders and as members of the church, we shall become great commission Christian. Having a great commission mind, having great commission eyes, seeing the world in the perspective of the great commission. That great commission is the greatest privilege known to the believer. It's a privilege of proclaiming so great salvation through Christ to the whole of humanity. Every member of the church, and of this district church in particular, is expected to do the will of God in carrying on the mission of Christ to the people of the world, to the, mission, to the people of this community. Already I've read it to you how Jesus Christ said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And then he says, Lo, I am with you always. What else do we need? What a great promise we have. It says, as we are in the path of duty, as we are obeying the Lord, it says, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. We'll talk about three points in the message. Number one, the mission of Christ. Number two, the mission of the church. Number three, the mission of the Christian. Now, you cannot separate or make any division or difference between the three missions of Christ, of the church, and of the Christian. The mission of the church is very, very similar to the mission of Christ. Why? Because the church is the bride and Christ is the bridegroom and they are joined together. And Christ loved the church that he gave himself and the church is supposed to love Christ and do the bidding of Christ, the bridegroom, the bride, Christ and the church. The mission of Christ is the same as the mission of the church. In fact, that's exactly what Jesus said. He said, I've started, you continue. I've come to reveal God unto humanity. Now the church is supposed to continue. Now also, the mission of the Christian cannot be different from the mission of Christ and the mission of the church. Why? Before you can fully spell that word Christian, you will first of all have to write fully the word Christ. It is after you have written the word Christian, then you will write I-A-N. Then you have Christian. So then it means the Christian comes out of Christ. Christ is the basis, the foundation of the Christian. The Savior, the Lord of the Christian. The controller, the captain of the Christian. Therefore, the mission that Christ started is the mission of the Christian. He evangelized. He won the lost. Therefore, the Christian today will have to follow that same pattern and will win the lost unto the Lord. Now you think about the Christian and the church. The mission of the church cannot be different from the mission of the Christian. Why? Because the church is like the body. And a Christian is like a member in that body. It is the same blood that flows in the head, flows in the hand, 
flows in the different parts of the body. Therefore, it is that same blood, whether you cut the hand or you cut the leg, the type of blood that comes out is the same. The same function, the same role, the same activity, and the same purpose and the same mission that you see in the church is what is revealed in the Christian. After all, the church is simply an assembly, a collection, a group of people that are called Christians. It's a collective thing you call the church, it's individual you call the Christian. Therefore, the missions are the same. Number one, the mission of Christ. Number two, the mission of the church. Number three, the mission of the Christian. Let's go to point one. The mission of Christ. Let's look at John chapter 17. Reading from verse 18. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them into the world. Here Jesus Christ revealed that the Father sent him into the world. And then at the same time he said, in that same way. For that same purpose, to carry out the same mission, am I sending them into the world? Christ came to this world. What did he come to do? We're told in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save. That which was lost before Jesus Christ came, all humanity had been lost. Far back to the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve sinned against God, and they were driven out of the place God had put them. And all their, all the offspring, all the children were born in exile. We were lost. The Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says we have all gone astray and we all do fade away like a leaf. Then Jesus Christ came and he wanted to bridge the gap and bridge the God, the chasm between Almighty God and little man, between the holy, pure, spotless, sinless God and sinful, corrupt man. And he came as a bridge in between God and man. And he called unto man. He didn't just sit in one place in Nazareth. He didn't just hide himself on one mountain top. Please, turn the cassette over. Expecting, let the people that want to be saved, let them come. He went about and he was seeking and he was searching to find, to save the lost. That's the mission that he came to fulfill. And in fulfilling that, he did it for cities. He did it for villages. He did it for individuals. Mark chapter 1. Reading from verse 35. And in the morning rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. What was he praying about? We're not told, but I believe this. That he was praying to the Father, saying, Father, the mission that you sent me to accomplish, I don't want it to fail. All my resources, all the things you have given to me as authority, as power. I want to use everything to accomplish the mission that you have granted me, that you have told me to have here in this world. He was praying to the Father that no soul will, uh, will, will miss his ministry, that he will be able to touch everyone, reach everyone, go everywhere, and bring the people that are sinful and lost and bring them unto the Father. And then in verse 36, and Simon and they that were with him followed after him. And when they had found him, they said unto him, All men seek for thee. They told him, Christ, you are popular. You are famous. Now people want to see you. They want to tie you down in this community so that they will raise you up as a famous, popular individual. But look at what he said in verse 38. He never forgot his mission. You see, the problem with the church many times is that we're easily sidetracked. If there is a kind of a economic problem, the church is sidetracked. If there is a kind of political kind of crisis, the church is easily sidetracked. 
to be thinking of the political crisis. But Christ was never sidetracked in verse 38. And he said unto them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For therefore came I forth. He knew the purpose for which he was here. And he was not going to allow anything, anything to sidetrack him. He knew that he came to call men unto repentance. Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9. Reading from verse 10 to verse 13. And it came to pass as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus had that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go, go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. You see the ministry of the Lord, the mission of the Lord. He came to call the sinners unto repentance. That was his mission. And he never allowed the ridicule of the Pharisees, of the scribes, to hinder him. He never allowed the misunderstanding and the misrepresentation, misinterpretation of his action that these Pharisees were voicing out. He never allowed that to hinder him from the goal, the mission, the purpose of his life. John chapter 3 verse 17. John chapter 3 verse 17. For God sent not a son into the world, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. When Jesus Christ was here in this world, there were a lot of things to condemn in the political system. There were a lot of things to condemn in the religious system. There were a lot of things to condemn in the social order. There were a lot of things to condemn in the relationship that people had with one another. There were a lot of things to condemn in the moral behavior and conduct of the people. But Jesus was never sidetracked. Never, never sidetracked. You see, there are some people that have zeal without knowledge. Activity without direction. And they have a lot of youthful exuberance without any particular purpose. They forget the mission of the church. And they'll be telling the church, look at this going on in the political world. Look at this going on in the military and the police. Look at this going on in the educational system. Look at this going on in the economic system. And they want the church to be sidetracked. To leave the mission that God has called us to. And then to begin to condemn this and condemn that. But it says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn. A lot of things there to be condemned. But that's not my purpose. That's not my mission. He said, but that was his mission. That the world through him might be saved. Let us give to that mission. That the world through him might be saved. In 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1 and in verse 15. We're still following through on the mission of Christ. This is a faithful saying. And worthy of all acceptation. That Christ came into this world, into the world, to save sinners of whom I am chief. Well then, Christ came to this world to seek and to save the lost. He came to call sinners to repentance. The Father sent him to carry out a specific ministry. And he never allowed himself to be sidetracked. Jesus went to individuals, still on that mission. He went to cities, still on that mission. He went to towns still on that mission to preach the gospel. He also sent out his disciples to proclaim the good news to those who are lost in sin and in darkness. From the mission of Christ, we learn a lot about the mission of the church. Christ is the head. The church is the body. It is where the head determines that the body will go. 
It is where the head goes, where the head is going, that the body too will be following after. Therefore, as we have studied and learned about the mission of Christ, at the same time, we have known and we have had a revelation of the mission of the church. Let's look at it closely once again and see the mission. We call it the Great Commission. Mission, commission, great commission that Christ gave unto the church. And this will help you and I to understand more clearly the reason why we are left here. You know, when you think about it, there is no reason for the church to remain here. Why it not for the fact that Christ has a mission already committed into the hands of the church? Well, don't you think about this. Christ as the bridegroom, the church as the bride, and the Lord has been planning for the marriage supper of the Lamb for such a long time. Why will the wedding not take place? Because the bride is still supposed to get something done. Why it not because of that mission, the rapture should have taken place long ago? Why it not for the fact that there's still a lot of people there being saved that ought to be saved? The church would have been raptured long time ago. Now, why do you think the Lord is leaving the church here? After all, there are temptations in the world, difficulties in the world, problems in the world, economy globally in the world is going down, and there are a lot of things the devil is activating in the world. Why will Christ leave his church over here in the realm of problem, in the realm of persecution, in the realm of trial, in the realm of temptation? Only one purpose, and it's because of that all-consuming, all-embracing purpose. That is why the church is let down here for now. What's that mission? Matthew chapter 28 again. Matthew chapter 28 again. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. As I told you, we discussed over that other weekend with our leaders, with our coordinators, and we re-examined again the different ramifications and the, all, the, all that it will mean for the church to carry out the commission, the great commission of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we re-examined again the necessity and the purpose and the reason for why the central church was decentralized. We, we re-examined the difficulties we had when we were all together in one central church and uh, many services in one single day and the hurry, the lack of ability or the chance to be able to pray and pray through the message, the transportation difficulty, the poverty among the people and the difficulty of bringing new people from the world, bringing them into the church, getting them converted and integrated with the church. And thereby we started the decentralized district church. That's why you are where you are now, with the people in your district. It is so that the mission of the church will be fully carried out and better carried out. Not only that, we saw that as we decentralized and we brought the church into the district, that it will now make the church to be a walking distance from a lot of people. And it is still in obedience to the word of the Lord, saying, Go ye therefore, and teach all nations. And he's saying, Teach all nations. Let's join that with him. Mark chapter 16, and in verse 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. We said, if we're going to carry out that mission properly, some of these creatures were to preach to, they're in the prison. And we must strengthen our prison outreach ministry. Some of these people are in the hospitals. We must strengthen the hospital outreach ministry. Some of these people are aged men and women who cannot easily come out to church. They must be a part of the church, an arm of the church. I mean your district church here that will go to the homes of the aged people, sing to them, work for them, clean their surroundings, and preach the gospel unto them. We talked about the possibility of the correspondence ministry. 
that some of us will have to be writing to people. We talk about the open air crusade. Uh, one of our coordinators testified about the program they have in the district that they styled 222. That is, reaching out, pairing people together. And they do it when they are free on Tuesday. They do it when uh, they are free on Wednesday. That is, those who are not coming to the central meeting of the workers. They do it on Friday. And they are bringing people. They are bringing people into the kingdom of God. We talk about the telephone counseling ministry. We talk about the use of literature. We talk about the possibility of having open air meeting in the district. That it is possible that a group of us, 10 of us, 20 of us, or perhaps the whole of the district can organize crusade together. And we said we can even use our cassettes, the cassettes of the successful, powerful crusades we have done in the past. We can use all that in the district. Some of us can use the films. Some of us can use the video. We can do a lot. We talk about reaching out to the youth, reaching out to the students in the community schools where you are. You can reach out to the primary school children. You can reach out to the secondary school children. If there is higher educational institution in your community, you can reach out to them. We said we can also reach out to the people that are behind a very iron, terrible iron gate. The dog is right there. At, uh, you know, at the door, you can write letters uh, preaching the gospel unto them. You can do it together as a district together. A lot of things we can do. A lot of things we can do to fulfill the mission of the church. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Then verse 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. We said we'll need to have a good, sound, workable, successful follow-up method. And we'll have to develop all that in the district. That's why, you know, your district, if you carry out all these things, and you carry out the mission of the church, you will find that from the few people you are now, a few hundreds you are now, you'll grow to a thousand. You'll go beyond a thousand. You can even help the language churches and we're expecting that the Yoruba church should be able to grow to about 500. And the language churches should be able to go to 250 each. A lot is ahead of us. It is the mission of the church. And you know, that's the great commission. And it's given unto the church. Let's look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. Acts of the Apostles chapter 1. From verse 8. But ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. We can do it. By the grace of God, we are going to do it. So that the church in the district will grow. So that the church will fulfill its mission that will reach all categories of people. You know, in the early days, everywhere the believers went, they preached the gospel. You cannot be in your market, on your trade, and not preach. In your office, and not preach. Or in the bus, and not preach. Or at the station, railway station, and not preach. Everywhere you go, let the church have a voice through you that will be speaking out to fulfill the mission of the church. Because we are, as a church, the light of the world. And we are, as a church, the salt of the earth. The church, as a body, has a mission to carry out for Christ in the world. The mission cannot be accomplished by individuals alone, but by the whole church. Praying, giving, sending, all these are different ministries that will assist and accelerate. Going to preach the gospel to every creature. It is the corporate dimension of the mission of the church. And yet, there is the individual dimension of the mission of the church so that we can fulfill the demand of the Great Commission. The church has a ministry to the redeemed in the church. At the same time, the church has a ministry to the lost in the world. We shouldn't make the mistake of thinking that all we have to do is done in the church building. We have to do a part of that. We have to carry out a part of that mission on the street. We have to carry a, a part of that mission on the road. We have to carry out part of that mission in the bus. 
We have to carry out part of that mission in the place of work in the market where the people are. Some parts of the mission carried out inside. Others carried out outside. For example, worship that's inside the church. Fellowship in the church. Edification in the church. Very necessary within the church. And yet, on the other hand, the church has evangelism to do outside. Missionary outreach will be necessary outside so that the lost can be won to the Lord. In conclusion, let me briefly talk about the mission of the Christian. As I said, the mission of the Christian cannot be different from the mission of Christ and cannot be different from the mission of the church either. Let's look at this in John chapter 4. John chapter 4, from verse 28. The woman then let a water pot and went away into the city and said to the men, Come see a man. We told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Here is a woman. She fulfilled her ministry in the Lord. And we shouldn't hinder our women to fulfill their ministry in the church. You see, as you consider the body, the hand cannot put a bandage on the eyes and tell the eyes, you don't function, I will do everything. The hands cannot put chains on the leg and say, you don't function, I, as the hand, will activate and function and do everything there is to be done. You see, sometimes uh, it's very painful, very painful, especially at a time like this. When there is population explosion in the world, when many people are dying without Christ, that a single person, maybe like one of the leaders in the church, will tie the hands of all the other people in the church and they cannot do anything. And the women coordinators and the women representatives and the women area leaders are not released, released to do the work they ought to do in winning other women to the Lord and to the church. It is unfortunate when we tie the hands of the young people and we tell them you cannot do anything because there is somebody that thinks he can do everything by himself or when we concentrate on the church problem ah we have this problem we have to pray about it we have this problem we have to think about it we have this problem we have to contribute concerning it we have this problem we have to discuss it we have this problem we have to think through it now you see when we are only thinking about a little problem we have within the church and we just bog everybody down, tie everybody down. They are not released, they are not free to go out and get the work done. Now look at this woman. She still had a lot of problems. The Lord Jesus has just told her, you have had five husbands before. And the one you are staying with now is not your husband. In that, you said right. Now she should have been thinking of the problem she had. Where will I live now? Which of the other five husbands is the right husband? Where will I pack to now? I will have accommodation now. She pushed all those problems to the background. And she went out into the city and said, Come see a man who told me everything that ever I did. It's not this the Christ. And brought a lot of people to Christ. Push your problems to the background. And you arise and work for the Lord. And you say, Lord, here I am. Here I am. I will do the work of the Lord. Acts chapter 8 and in verse 4. Acts chapter 8 verse 4. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Have you ever noticed this? I know you've read it before, but you don't understand. Their houses were in Jerusalem. They drove them out of their houses. Where they came, no accommodation. Where they came, it was a strange land. Where they came, no job. The job they were doing in Jerusalem, they had been hindered because of the persecution. But all the problem of the loss of job, the loss of accommodation, being catapulted into a strange land where they didn't have anything that will sustain life in the natural. They forgot all that and it says they went everywhere preaching the word, preaching the word. The time has come for you and for me to arise on our feet and to promise the Lord saying Lord nothing will distract me nothing will hinder me my specific ministry of reaching out 
evangelizing, witnessing, testifying, bringing people to the kingdom of God and edifying in the church, worshiping in the church, teaching in the church, the time has come for me to carry it out. Why don't you rise up? Why don't you rise up and forget every other problem? Forget every other concern. Forget every other preoccupation and say, God, I will. God, I will. God, I will. It's a new area of involvement in the district church. Coordinator will get involved, leaders will get involved, members will get involved. Everyone is needed to carry out the mission of the church. You have a mission. You have to evangelize. You have to witness. You have to testify. You have to teach in the church. You have to do things in the church, worship in the church, edify other people in the church. You tell the Lord, I bring my all. I consecrate my all. And the Lord will use you in the work there is to be done.